Now, I did say last week that we'll be visiting uh, the Canary Islands, and that's precisely a scene um, uh, um, from the Canary Islands. We'll, we'll be visiting the wonderful um, uh, ca uh, cave system, and that cave system, the Caves of Veleron. And I, I thought that this, this would be a nice little quirky little topic. At times, it's difficult to get your uh, teeth into the subject matter. Um, but we'll definitely give it a go. So, Keith, what image are you actually showing on your screen at this minute? Yeah, it looks like a cave with a deeper, deeper recess, uh, recesses in it. Excellent. Excellent. That's, that's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. And also, if we move to this next one, um, I need to change my screen. And hang on a minute, technical problem a minute. Um, start again and go. Right. Are you seeing this? Yes, yes, yes. A uh, lot of a uh, holy rock. Not sure what the size of our scale of it is, but uh, presumably man made. Yeah, exactly. So what I'm going to do is I think my technical problems are that I've got two sets of slides and I'm going to have to keep dashing between the two. So to give you an idea where we are, um, let's place the Canary Islands on a map. And is that what you're seeing now? Yep. Good. So the caves of Valeron, it could be said at an enigma. And the one thing about the caves should be said is the connection with a certain set of mummies that many people have talked about over the ages. The Guauche mummies. Now, I've mentioned the mummies associated with the Guauche a number of times. And when I've... And the reason why I've mentioned them, I, I've, I've sort of put them into the context of the Ananerbe from the Second World War. I've sort of put them into the context of the Spanish on the Canary Islands. So we, we've mentioned them a few times. So today we will actually see some of the Guauche mummies as well. Now, the Canary Islands, but by that even map, but by what you're seeing is a place of complete isolation. But what we do see is that a very rich culture. Now, th this, is, this is the thing. A very rich culture is being understood to have existed across the Canary Islands well before the Spanish got there. Now, the history books, in the main, paint of a very backward culture on the Canary Islands before the Spanish got there. A, a backwards culture, but they still mummified their loved ones. And it's thought that the honeycomb landscape that I'll just show you again. Um, hang on, if I just show you. Hang on a minute. If I show you this honeycomb landscape, it was believed that the Guauche actually lived in these caves. And so what? So the the build build up of this is that the Spanish got to the island. We've got descriptions that uh, there's all these caves. Two and two came together and come up with eight. Um, and it was the assumption that these were backwards people. They were troglodytes. They lived in caves. They, 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 they buried their loved ones in caves. And that was basically it. But that's very much far away from the truth. The other, the other thing that we really don't understand about the people on the Canary Islands that is still an enigma, which will remain an enigma, is of Spanish accounts of what the women looked like on the Canary Islands. Now, there's this there's this preconception that there were these were these tall, um, slender looking women with beautiful blonde hair, and and that was what the um, Spanish conquerors of the Canary Islands actually wrote down in their annals. So in the in the fourteen 90s as they get into the Canary Islands they describe these women 
So the reason why it's an enigma, the archaeology tells us that the archaeology, the, the mummies tell us um, that um, that isn't exactly true. Because when people have examined the mummies, even though they found blonde hair, they, they've actually worked out that the um, the, the natural um, colorants that are in, in the hair that give us dark or light colors have actually faded. So in other words, lots of the mummies almost seem as if they got red hair rather than blonde hair. And this is all really interesting stuff. So I've got to do a little bit of a back explanation here as well. The, the Ananurbe Second World War, um, the, the SS uh, archaeologists wanted to find this pure Aryan race. And the idea of a pure Aryan race is finding these, these blonde beauties around the planet could have gone into their sort of theories of ethnic cleansing if they had looked more into these mummies. But if they look more into these mummies, their preconceptions, their actual analysis would have been faulted because the mummies that do survive associated with the Guauche telling us a different story to what the Spanish told us. So history can't always be relied upon to give you the archaeology. And that's the reason why we're here today. So again this sense of isolation on the on this sort of volcanic rock a series of volcanic rocks let's sort of look a little bit more about the the series of volcanic rocks to give you a nice bit of context so again we've talked about the, the we've talked about this as an area of isolation and uh, when, it, when i was when i was looking at this on tuesday evening i to be honest with you i i was i was quite ill and um i was unable to articulate what I was really wanting to put across, um, but everyone at the end said, "Oh, they, they they really enjoyed they really enjoyed the lecture anyway." So you can you can you can you can see you can see the um, you can see we're looking at um, we're looking at Grand Canaria here, and again we're we're looking at um, quite a distance from the coast. And Mike's just arrived, so I've got to I've got to make Mike comfortable. Hang on a minute, Mike. Let's move this away. There you go, Mike. We're looking at the Guauche mummies, Mike. Yeah. And I've left you some crumbs from my bread and my toast, okay? So, uh, Goff, my best mate Mike shirt as well. Ooh. Back again. Back, 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 back again. Back again. Back again. Loves it, doesn't he? He, he? he loves it. Mike always comes back. He wouldn't buy any of my eggs this week. <laughs> oh, 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 hang on a minute, right? And he's also brought me this, a treasure hunting magazine. It's full of coins. I know it's full of bloody coins. They found them through metal detecting, you plonker. You don't have to have it. Yeah, I am. It's, it's really good. I like the thimbles in here. Oh, and there's also a, um, a series on um, ring pulls through the ages. Thanks for that, Mike. <laughs> anyway, crack on. Crack on. And Mike comes in here. He, rip, he rips part of my cave away as well. So, what, what, what we, what, one thing that we, we do know about the Grouche is that uh, we, we know that they would have spread uh, across a majority of these islands. But what we don't really understand is how many, how many, um, many of these people on the, these islands actually mummified their loved ones. Because what happened when the Spanish arrived on the islands, they, the first thing that they did, they went into the caves. And when they went into the caves, they obviously wanted to see if they were full of wealth and treasure and so on. We don't have any records of what they actually found in the caves. Other than one thing, they found the caves were full of mummies. Hundreds of thousands of mummies. Now... The Guauche themselves, as a people, as can be associated with any normal, everyday garden island people, like New Zealanders, um, like the Tasmanians, like Australians, are, are persecuted by those people who invade. The, the New Zealand does come out of it better. We, we, we see something much worse 
that um, with the people of Easter Island. So when people go into these places, it's almost as if they eradicate the culture and, and they they take as much out of the culture as they possibly can. And one of the one of the key pieces of evidence that archaeologists would like more of today is those mummies. It's a bit like going to ancient Egypt and um, taking all the mummies out and, and and burning them or making them into or grinding the mummies down that they that they that they actually did. Um, and they made that into a paste and it helped with stomach ache, for example. Um, and they would have burnt lots of the mummies as well in the new industrializing uh, processes that were, were coming into the 15, 1600s. So we've lost a big chunk of the archaeological evidence. And, and what I, 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 I really struggle today to actually find much in the way of artifacts to show you. So that's, that's going to be a little bit of a disappointment there. But if we move on again, this is actually one cave system that's been hollowed out of very hard volcanic rock. And inside here is basically tooth, is very soft volcanic rock. So you've got a very hard igneous rock. And then inside you've got this, um, you've got this really soft rock that these people were actually able to um, carve these holes into. So that's what we're going to look at. So let's have, a, let's have a few key facts of what we're actually seeing on the screen. So the caves of Valeron. Now, when I when I initially looked at this on the internet, this was this was a couple of months ago. Um, have you ever heard of this, the caves of Valeron, Mike? No. No, he's never heard of it. Have you ever heard of it, Keith? No. no. I'm not going to even ask uh, Goff because he's probably been there. Have you ever seen this, Goff? No, I know about it. Then. Yeah, I'm sure you do. It's not one of those places that women used to hang out, mm -hmm. is it? No, they're called brothels. <laughs> Me and Mike don't know anything about brothels. Anyway, the Caves of Veleron, also known as Veleron's Monastery, is an ancient pre-Hispanic rock-cut complex of honeycomb caves on the northwest of the mountain of Galician Monta de Gallego in the Spanish island of Gran Canary. Now... If we, if we left there, we've used the word monastery. These are not monasteries. And obviously, we don't really understand their religion either. We, 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 we're struggling to understand other than what we're seeing. Particularly with this site at the Caves of Veleron. There, there are other cave networks all the way across the Canary Islands. But this is the one we're looking at today. Now, it may seem of a little bit of a surprise, but the dimensions of that cave are uh, 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 not as expansive as what I'm going to actually read out. So the caves were constructed by the ancient Canarians using stone and wooden tools inside a large 20 meter tall natural arch. Now the arch is basaltic rock, basalt rock, ig igneous rock, covering a volcanic tooth. So, so all that stuff inside, all that honeycomb there is actually very, very soft rock. A type of rock made of volcanic ash ejected from a vent during a volcanic eruption that lith lithified into a solid material. But, but it wasn't solid uh, to the state that people couldn't actually construct what we're actually seeing. So, again, it, it's this idea that people lived within these caves and lots of archaeologists are actually saying, no, they're used for something else. They, they just buried their loved ones in them. And, and you just think, well, actually, it, initially, they were used for something else. Now, there's, there's a parallel there. And the, and the parallel and, and the parallel is, is with, with other cultures around the world. And what you do see is you see rock-cut rock, rock um, structures like this. Um, and they're full of bodies. And when we come over to Britain, we, we see the likes of what we call burial chambers, um, like the like Tinkerswood burial chamber, um, uh, the, um, in Anglesey, you see all these places that we call burial chambers. And then lots of archeologists are arguing that they may have actually been used for something else 
before they become burial chambers. Yeah, and this is the thing with these with these caves, the, these these cuttings into this soft rock on the Canary Islands. Um, we might actually find human remains in them, in some of them, or we would have, if they wouldn't have all been taken out. They were recorded as being here. Um, and, but before the initial use, when you actually get excavating them, you actually find evidence of grain. Now that's interesting, because the first use was to store everything other than human remains. Now that's a really that's a really interesting point. So this is what the archaeologists are doing. They're actually starting to study these types of sites for a little bit more information to actually say everything that we d did know about this wonderful landscape is very very different. So the ancient um, Guauche, um, the Canarians, which sounds quite strange, the Canarians, you could say are a pseudo aboriginal inhabitant of the island and um, when I say pseudo inhabitant of the island they didn't actually walk over there they, they, they would have had to have actually um, there was no land bridge with North Africa and the Canary Islands and why would there be because the Canary Islands of a um, volcanic big bit of a volcanically formed islands um, as we can, as we've already explained, the, the basaltic rock and, and you've got the soft tooth and all the rest of it. So, you know, it's never been traditionally um, real islands. They, they've never split off from Africa. They, they've been created. And so therefore, people would have had to have um, got over to the likes of the Canary Islands um, by boat. So where did they come from? That, 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 that's the... That's the big question. Where did these people come from? Now, if we if we go back to early descriptions, um, we go back to early descriptions associated, for example, um, that the Spanish give us. People have said, obviously, that these, these people are actually descended from the Romans. But when you actually look at the, the Guauche mummies themselves, it looks very much that they are genetic from the genetics as well it looks very much that they're related to people from North Africa not and, and it used to, it used to be thought that the Canary Islands were, were a good location for Atlantis and it used to be argued so if we cha change the image a moment it used to be argued that this is actual proof um, of this being the existence of Atlantis. It's, it's categorical proof, isn't it, Mike? That's got to be Atlantis. No. He's saying no, so I believe Mike. I believe Mike. But when people didn't have any information, what they did initially in the beginning of the 1900s, late 1800s, they used to say, look, we've got, we got evidence of people living on the Canary Islands. They've created this type of landscape. We've got them creating mummies like the ancient Egyptians. Um, they're blonde headed and um, and so on and so on. So these have got to be these have got to be Atlanteans. These have got to, got to be the, the Amazons of the Atlant Atlantic I Atlantic Islands, Atlantic Ocean. But unfortunately, the archaeology tells us this is nothing to do with Plato's ideas of Atlantis and Herodotus's ideas of Atlantis. Now, Herodotus first wrote about the Atlanteans being in North Africa um, in around 450 years BC. And then, then Plato's writing then in about 350 years uh, BC, right? Um, Plato's then writing about Atlantis being somewhere um anyway so we can we can cut that idea out of our minds the main thing is is about these people we do believe that these people are from north africa they're the berber people of north africa um and they obviously came from the north african mainland so after the arrival of the spanish to the canaries the usual story the native population was mainly wiped out mainly wiped out with only small numbers of um, Guauche people 
assimilating into the Spanish settler population. It must have been a very hard life for the, for the Guauche to actually live alongside a, a culture that's completely alien to them. Now, even when we look at the likes of the Inca, for example, even when we look at the likes of the Inca, almost overnight, a very high culture is eradicated. Um, a high culture is completely taken away from history, right? And, and as much of the Inca world is, is, is erased. And this is what we can see very similar to what's happening on the Canary Islands. They may have actually been quite an advanced people, but the evidence has been destroyed. Has, has been has been removed what we do know they they lived in settlements which were overlooked by these cave systems and the cave systems are more important than meets the eye very much more important than meets the eye so it could be said and here's, here's a step into the blue it could be said that maybe some of the people on the Canary Islands may have had cultural exchange with with the Roman world. That's on the assumption that the Berber people have already got to the Canary Islands. Could we have had Roman settlement on the Canary Islands? Well, we know that Roman traders were heading all the way over to the United States. And we've got evidence of uh, the Romans heading all the way to South um, South America to the likes of Rio de Janeiro and um, Roman traders would have obviously gone around the African coastline so they wouldn't have been aware of the Canary Islands but there's and, and the Greeks as well and the Phoenicians they would have been aware of the Canary Islands but in regards to archaeological evidence associated with any of those people we don't really find it what we do find in some of those caves is barley and dried fig seeds so the radiocarbon dating of dried fig seeds found in situ suggests that the caves date from a period that's nothing to do with ancient Rome. Mike's happy with that because he hates the Romans. Don't you, Mike? Big smile on his face. And he haven't even had a cup of tea. You'll have to wait for a cup of tea, Mike. Unless you want to put your kettle on and put, do yourself a cup of tea, Mike. No rush. No rush, okay. I won't bother either. So the radiocarbon date, dating of the fig seeds, the dried fig seeds, dates what you're seeing behind us not to 2,000 years ago, not to 3,000 years ago, but dates lots of the excavations here to create, to create these to 1,040 years AD. But that, that that's an interesting thing. So they, they've and they, they found dried fig seeds. That may have been a re result of a secondary use. So I've got to eat my own words, haven't I? Because I've already said that we found Guauche mummies in these caves. that probably date from about the 1450s. But the evidence below that dates to dried fig seeds from the 1040s. And then what we've got is a revelation. The revelation is that radiocarbon date studies, radiocarbon studies tell us that the dried barley that they've actually found in some of some of these similar sites, and this one, this one in particular, the barley radiocarbon dating evidence puts one of the uses of these holes, I've got to say one of the uses of these holes, not the creation of these holes, to around 1330 to 1410. So that's very, very interesting. And the other interesting point is, is that these people managed to survive as an indigenous, pseudo-indigenous population of the Canary Islands without being wiped out sooner. Maybe the, 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 the maybe the Portuguese. We we mentioned the Portuguese, haven't we? We we mentioned um, the Portuguese would have been aware of these islands before the Spanish, because the Portuguese we know are heading all the way over to Benin, 
we mentioned the Portuguese with the Benin bronzes, for example. And we're, we're talking about that interchange between the Portuguese ever before the Spanish get, get to that part of Africa. So the Portuguese would have been aware of these people, but the Portuguese didn't conquer the island. They didn't, they didn't, they, what, what is the difference between the Portuguese and the Spanish? The Portuguese seem to be a lot nicer people than, than the Spanish in history. I'm going to be shot down by, but mind, mind you, I, I, I used to know a very, really nice Portuguese woman once, but we won't talk about that. And I didn't meet her in a brothel either. Unlike um, Goff. According to local legend, the caves, caves were used as a monastery or a place for priestesses. The celibate Haringuadas, the celibate Haringuadas, the priestesses. And local legend tells us that this is a matriarchal society, not patriarchal, matriarchal society dominated by women. As society is now being very much dominated by women. Um, as you can tell when, when Chris, his wife, is saying, look, here's a cup of tea, drink it now, otherwise I'll burn you at the stake, that type of thing. Yeah. So this is a matriarchal society on the Canary Islands. Um, and it's said that the women were actually confined within the caves, these very caves on the Canary Islands. And it said that these women were of noble class. So the young women were isolated, were confined. And they couldn't mm -hmm. be interfered with by, by men or anything like that. And they had to lead, lead a celibate life until they got married. That's what local legend tells us. But there's a problem with that. If most of the Guauche had been wiped out by the Spanish... Where did that information come from? And there's no archaeological evidence to support that, but it, it, it's very much that sense of a matriarchal society where women dominate. That's a really interesting point. And the reason why that's a really interesting point is because we're, there's no signs of warfare on the island. On the islands. On the islands. There's no sign of warfare. Um, and what we usually see is that... Um, in female dominated society the likelihood of warfare is 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 abated you know um, so so we keep away from so it's it's more of an agriculturally based society now this this cave complex complex let's just sort of move move the image on again because I'll have Goff shouting at me there wasn't enough images today all right then there you go um, and they're basically different layers. There's about eight layers within this cave. Again, eight layers. Uh, and and one, one point that was actually being made. One, one, one point that was actually being made. Which we actually looked at on Tuesday. Is that it's going to be a struggle. To understand. These caves. Because of. Erosion. The problem is with with erosion from wind erosion and waterborne erosion. It's going to distort what we're looking at. So these 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 were. I, I know what it looks like. It looks like a honeycomb, and it looks like these have been crudely created, but they're not. These have been properly quarried out on eight levels. With with little holes in the soft rock. To actually get further up. So we see all that. We've got that information coming actually. Let's get back to my notes. So altogether we're looking at about nearly 300 compartments that were used as silos. Um, silos. That, that sort of makes you think of grain doesn't it? But we've mentioned that there's evidence for other uses. And it's also believed that they were closed in by wooden planks. And it's also said that there's evidence that they were sealed. They, there were seals on them. So basically, Dave Bloggs, the Guauche, had one hole. Um, and Fanny Craddock, the Guauche, had another hole. Um, 
and basically a seal had been placed on the door to indicate that 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 was actually belonging to that family and it the the, the spanish word for the seal is a pintadera a pintadera that indicated its ownership so th these these are actually getting a lot more complicated so the natural arch regulated temperature and humidity providing an ideal location for storage of foodstuffs from the element and that's another interesting thing anyone that knows anything about caves will know that temperatures in caves remain the same 24 7. so say for example in an underground cave network in scotland and in the valleys and anywhere in britain the cave temperature will remain an average of 11.5 uh, degrees c um, all the time no matter how cold it is outside or no matter, uh, how warm it is inside it will remain that same temperature all the time it might feel cold to the human but that that's um you know 11.5 degrees is is the mean temperature for caves and that's interesting because if if one one point to be made is if we sort of go back a little bit more what you can see is that the sun will hit the lowest levels and then the medium levels will be hit by some sunlight and then the top levels won't be hit by any sunlight at all which means the top levels hit that very point that these caves had different regulations of temperature the further you go up so that means that you could store grain on the lowest levels within these silos with wooden doors on them and naturally the heat would abate moisture causing problems to the grain causing bacteria to grow and ergot so you could imagine that grain is being stored on the lowest levels you could go in there, a handful of grain, it would be perfect for using what you need to use. And then if you want to keep something really cool to last a, a bit longer, you might put them in the upper or medium levels. So these people had regulation of temperatures in their natural larders that they actually created. So it gives you, it gives you an idea that these people, these Groucho people are not the club wielding troglodytes that we think of them to be in history and you can see that they're they're a little bit um you can see how they're they're actually cut there so naturally they they had access to bone and and, and wood um to actually hollow these out and, and naturally the harder basaltic rock to actually uh, do some more of the work so so the temperature and humidity um, varied to actually store the food within these caves. Academics have suggested that the caves share comparisons with similar granaries or, or agadirs found in North Africa, which would have a common storage area communally guarded with chambers allocated for specific individuals. So it might be that thing that um, some individuals who had the best of the crop i.e. they wanted to keep fish or something that um, needed to be kept cool in the upper levels maybe communal at the bottom that's where all the grain was stored at different levels different chambers were, were utilized by different people for different purposes but one, one thing that we can actually clearly say now, straight away, is that these, these caves themselves were not used for living in. S several dwelling caves are also found within the caves, within the vicinity of the caves of Valeron, such as the La Presa caves and those within the complex itself. With the ancient settlement of La Raga most likely being associated so you've got the idea of guache settlements 
So that, that that's that's really important. Guauche settlement. So what what I'm what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at some of the other images um, and then we're going to discuss the caves a little bit more with some other information and then we're going to leave the Guauche mummies to after the after the break and obviously we've got the the articles of the week and Mike wants us to read this magazine with the very rare Athelred the second penny being found yeah. Anna Forger's hoard that wasn't you Mike was it in 1978, the caves were declared a historical art artistic monument or site of cultural interest within the category of the archaeological zone by royal decree. And in 1985, became a property of cultural interest. So what I'd like to do is look a little bit at, um, look a little bit at the, um, oh God, let me get my words out. Um, I just got to make sure that I've got my my other file up here a minute and uh, so whilst whilst I'm faffing about you a minute Goff is this anything to what you've heard oh, I haven't heard that much about them I know they're there no I, I don't know what what were you told they were come on then let's just just spit it out well I told they were, they were caves made by the uh, the native people of, of the Canaries and you can get bus trips there and stuff like that. But did they say why they were created? Did they say that they lived in them? I, I haven't researched that. I don't know. Okay. Okay. Sorry to bully you there. Um, Go ahead. I I next, next week I'll get my whip in. Oh yeah. <laughs> so you you what what you what you can see? Um, spot the pigeon. It's a nice pigeon. There. Yeah. Uh, pigeon. Piece of pigeon. No, it looks like a bloody pigeon. It's albatross. <laughs> it hasn't got a stick on it. Albatross! Anyone want an albatross? <laughs> no, I haven't got wolf nipple chips! <coughs> Alright. Sorry. Right, so you can see that these are not these these look like they could be could have started off quite uh, these could have started off as boxes, but unfortunately, due to the erosion, um, we then see that these are hollowed out, um, and it it's very difficult to sort of explain more to how these would have originally looked because erosion has had its um, had its way with what we're actually seeing, and again nearly 300 of them here and there probably would have been many more now i just what we do find is that in regards to their art and culture we do find the occasional carvings now i know this is very faint and it, the, the the image that i had that i actually got this from was very faint uh, but you can actually get an idea how they portrayed themselves i know this is a, a faint image or maybe how they portrayed others. The, the Guauche people would have been aware. This, the, the, the point I'm trying to make, they would have been aware of other people um, as people pass by. But when they actually got from Africa, that, that's, that's a difficult thing to work out. Now, I'm just going to double check something on it. Right, there we go. Guauche mummy. Now, this is the sort of preconception. Right. Okay, and let's just just chuck this away. Look at those images, and look at that mummy. Now there are only twenty mam. There are only twenty Guauche mummies that I'm aware of, anywhere in the world. Only twenty, and there's not one in Aberdeen, by the way. Right? No, but not that I'm aware of. There, there's now you're looking at that. One of the Guauche mummies. Um, what we do see is they're wrapped in skins. So, you know, the, the, but after the break. Right, so we, we've seen that image. And then we look at this. So, in textbooks, the Guauche were the tall native inhabitants of the Canary Islands. Now, do we believe that? They were just about exterminated by the Spaniards at the, at the turn. Well... 
that that's actually wrong. The, the, the Spanish didn't get there until the end of the 1400s. So about 14, 1480 odd, um, that's when 1490 that the uh, Spanish exterminated the people. So that's another fact that's wrong in this. According to Encyclopedia Britannica, we need to edit that. The Grouche are thought to have been of Cro Magnon origin. Cro Magnon basically means what we, the, our direct ancestors, sort of Homo sapiens sapiens, as the Cro Magnon is, uh, and had blue or grey eyes and blondish hair. These ancient mysterious people also left stone pyramids and mummified their dead. Where did the Grouche come from? Goff, did you hear about them building stone pyramids? No. Exactly. So the problem is, the preconception of these people is completely different than what we're actually seeing in the archaeology. As, as, much, as much as we'd love to think that the men are butch like that, the ideal man for Kathy, are wonderfully slim, like that woman with blonde hair, the ideal woman, not for you, Keith. You, you like rough and ready like me. The <laughs> ideal woman for the likes of Goff. That image is wrong, but that is an image that we think represents the Guauche people. So, what I'd, what I'd like to do is I'd like to read out a little bit more text. Um, even though I was as, as massively as high as a kite when I started this today, um, I, I'm starting to uh, wane a little bit, but uh, we'll, I'll keep going until um, I need a break. So there, there's also other cave networks um, called the Painted Cave, the Galdar Painted Cave, which is near um, the Veron, um, 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 Valeron system. So in my notes, it refers it to as the collective granary on eight levels. And the, the holes that you're actually seeing, the silos, are one and three square meters um, on average. So I don't know if that means they're either one um, or, or three square meters, but um, if it's one and three square meters, then it's one or three, um, um, it's a rectangle, isn't it? So I think that means that some are one square meter and others are three square meters. Um, and the archaeologists are reluctant to actually say that they're just used for silos. Some are saying that they're little rooms, um, caves and cavities. Um, and they, they, were, they were excavated in a very soft, as we mentioned, tooth, cemented volcanic tephra in the northwest face of the mountain known today as Montana del Galerigo, as we've already mentioned. <laughs> so between some of these three square meter carvings that they're too small to live in by the way you're not going to get a full family in them you might you've got might get a few little people there you go we we, we see that the communication between them um may have we know there were steps we know we found carvings of steps in the rock sort of little holes in the rocks and, and they're terraced and we we believe that the ropes would have been used in scaffolding, but there's really no clear evidence on the ropes and scaffolding. We've got evidence of that they that they've been shut uh, with either wood. That there's, there's sign that there's signs that there's 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 little carvings in the rock to say that something was attached there, um, either by wood or textile or leather. Um, there is evidence of some stone slabs. We know that some were actually um, sealed with stone slabs. Um, and when I say sealed, um, closed, because that conflicts with the word seal that we used earlier on, put little seals on them to sort of indicate you actually owned them. The holes, as well as their grooves, were sealed in addition with um, a mortar. So they, they, they could use mortar. They, they could build with mortar. So hang on, the troglodytes building with mortar, that don't make, make sense. And the other thing as well is, what we do think is that some of them were sealed in completely. Um, and that the holes between the, the door that was created 
were actually filled in with a mortar until the contents were needed, until the grain within was needed. <coughs> Small idols have been found, <coughs> ceramics, human bones, the human bones being placed there after the primary uses, ashes as well. Ashes are a really good indicator that they're that they're um, that they've got corn drying going on because they, they need to heat up um, the, the corn to sort of get rid of any dampness and moisture um, so it can be preserved. And there's also something else weird that, that I found very strange when I was doing research about this. Now, th this is a very strange thing. We've got no archaeological evidence for this, but I will say it. I only come across this, across this week. Uh, the Spanish mention that these people had towers. They, they had towers. So they, they had really tall structures. But none of those tall structures exist today. Now that's 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 a real that the Spanish got the got the description of the women wrong or, or did they? Right, because we've got so few skeletons. Some of the some of the skeletons, if we if we interpret it rightly or wrongly, have different hair than the Berber example that I've actually shown you as well. I didn't actually tell you that. So we don't really know if the Spanish. Why would the Spanish be lying about that? Because the Spanish. Spanish said that the women on the Canary Islands before they, um, you know, the natives were actually beautiful, long, slim women. Why did they actually tell us that? Why would they be lying about that? And why would they be lying about telling us that the Guanche had tall towers? Surely if they're, they're indicating that these Guanche people had engineering skills equal to their own. Now, that's a very interesting very interesting point i can't say any more about that though. that's a very interesting thing indeed one of those enigmas the sheer size of the complexes across the islands is witness to the importance of agriculture specifically on grand canary uh, for subsistence but also for the society's social political structure and the power of its governing caste now i that I, I get really all and um I get really awkward about hearing that because how can you say that if we we don't really have the evidence and you know um anyway it's it, it's assumption it's people assuming the archaeology too much um among the canary islands we we do we do know that they had access to um cattle as well now they would have had to have moved over from Africa. So an another thing, they, they had um, agriculture was was mainly dominated, however, by plantations, uh, with much of these being grains. So they're a very, 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 very rich culture. Very rich culture. Now <coughs> this is where something comes in very, very odd. There's a little fact that I didn't chuck in earlier on. You know this name about the monastery i didn't tell you where that came from did i the word monastery the, the monasteries <laughs> of um the monasteries of valeron come from roman writing so did the romans know about how much did the romans know about these islands um so the name of monastery comes from the roman belief that herein had lived some celibate priestesses called the Harima Guadas, um, Guades, as we mentioned earlier on. Harim, Harima Guada, Guadas, uh, with whom young women of, no, of noble class came to live until they're married. So I've already mentioned that, but I didn't put as much information on it as I should have. Um, and this was something that a French archaeologist, a guy, Mar Marx Marche, um, a French archaeologist, was obsessed with at the beginning of the 1900s. And I told you, lots of this stuff comes from the 1900s. Where did this Roman thing come from? Did somebody actually make it up and sort of attribute it to the Romans? We, we don't really know. Uh, this was first to recognise its real use as being obviously similar to that of other structures of the island. And of North Africa. In um, so what, what we're talking about um, is is this got to do with women being kept until they're to be married? But 
Then again, lots of other evidence tells us something else. And then he goes on to say, actually, they did store food there as well. In addition, some of the chronicles mention the practice of preserving the food in crags um, of difficult access. So that they, 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 um, they, they, these, these were quite some distance in land, but would have been visible. The North African granaries of our Agadirs and our North African context, so a comparison, often have a common storage area guarded by the community to which it belongs, with chambers used and maintained by individuals. So that's where the towers come in. They, they needed these towers. Obviously, the grain, the grain is key to this, these people's survival. It's actually key to how these people actually survive. Now, there's there's so many of these caves. Um, um, near La Palmas, for example, there's one known as um, La Isleta. Um, there's there's one called the King's Cave, uh, to Jeddah. Uh, there's the uh, caves of um, the Granary, of Guemes. There's lots of these localities across these islands lots of them on Gran Canaria and but the ones the ones Gran Canaria it said that even though this one is, <coughs> is knowable we know where it is a few caves were dug in ice isolated locations most of them are near the sea coast and are concentrated often in large groups the larger structures are near near um, what we believe to be settlements associated with these pre-Hispanic times. The settlements of Taldi and Galda, associated with the Guauche. Now that's interesting. If you if you go into this thinking, I, I was convinced, I've got to be honest with you, that I, I've got to be honest with you, I was convinced that these people just lived in caves until I started doing research. I was convinced of it. Um, but then, then I was proven to be completely wrong which is great i like being completely wrong but i've learned something myself so obviously receiving a government um protection and there's footpaths to this landscape and it's associated with a national park and wonderful wonderful goff mentioned about gaining access to these caves, which, which is definitely something that I've read about. So what, what I'd like to do now is I would like to, after the break, we will look a little bit into the mummies. I would like questions. What are we going to do, Mike? Yeah. Stop falling asleep. Find me the best article on there on the coin, right? Go on, best one. It's going to be in Wales. You've got, you got a few minutes. It's got to be from Wales. We, 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 you know, we, we've got to keep it local. Anyway, thanks for getting that, Mike. And also, Goff, Mike yeah. brings me loaves of bread. No. I see. No. Yeah, it's a current loaf, yeah. Sliced fruit loaf. I'm embarrassing the fact out of him now. And look, look at that there. I got a little, little chocolate cake as well. Oh, I hope there's enough for all of us. Yeah. Oh, by the way, shut up, you. Um, by the way, Chris told me to tell you all that he's he had his second jab today. So there you go. Oh, good for him. All right, got mine too. <laughs> Arnold. Arnold, Arnold, not Chris. Right, okay, talking about numpties, right? Knock my caves out, I've gone. No. Oh. Like, Mike, I got my bit of cave in here. We're only doing questions now. I don't mind if I don't see you, Mike. Oh, sorry, Mike. He's not happy that he can't take part. Is that okay, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Right, so, uh, right, any questions, darlings? Oh, that looks good, doesn't it? Look at that. It's a, it's a box. Um... Right, um, start off with Keith. Keithy, babes. Didn't we have a when you uh, a lecture a couple of months ago about the Spaniards in Central America reporting they'd found a tribe of uh, tall blonde uh, people? Ah, uh, yes. 
uh, uh, the Spaniards seem to have a habit of doing this, and then there's no evidence <laughs> for it. Yeah, but but the thing is, they were right. They 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 they, they were right. The 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 people north of the Inca kingdom, and you know what, right? I was so into that, I've forgotten the name of these people. But yeah, you are right. They they did turn out to be very different genetically. So you're right. The Spanish have a habit. Cachapoyas. The Cachapoya people. The, oh, the Chacapoya people. Yeah, that's it. I remember. I, I love saying it all the time. The Chacapoya. Say it again. The Chacapoya people. Yeah, these people were very much as in the descriptions of the Canary Islands. But we know they were right there. So why can't they be right here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think the problem is what I've done and all the information goes into one pot. Right into one pot, and that pot is that the Guauche are just one people. That they are one genetic people. Because we don't have all those other mummies, we think they're all one genetic people. We've got such a small sample of evidence, and most of these money mummies are not available to study. There's only twenty of them. If you want to compare this with ancient Egypt, where there's hundreds. Yeah. Not hundreds, yeah, no. tens of thousands of them in, in across the world, right? I, I could turn around and say, right, Kathy, right, you sample all the mummies in America. Keith, you sample all the mummies in Britain. I'll sample the ones in Egypt. Jane can do the ones in Italy, right? And we'd be able to have a good idea of the genetic type. But we can't do that with the Guauche because most of the evidence for the Guauche mummies no longer exists. So the key to what we've got and the everything and the settlements is down to these mummies. And, and I've got to be honest with you, I've discounted what the Spanish have said. But I didn't when I did the Chacapoya people. So I've been very biased and that was, that's been very naughty of me. Right. But maybe I should believe what the Spanish have said because they were completely correct about the Chacapoya. And that, that's a really good point. I, again, I like to be corrected like a little school child with a good old dap on my backside by Goff. Uh, smack across the ear, maybe. Oh, that's real. No, no, no. That might bring some scent back to me. Um, <laughs> Goff. No, that's, that's very interesting. That's great. Fascinating. Good, good, yeah. good, good, good. Um, Jim, Jim looks like something out of a dodgy porn movie from the 80s that I've never watched. So I'm not going to ask Jim. Keith. Uh, you've already asked me, but I would also say, uh, did you say these caves are only dated to about a thousand years ago? That's the problem. That is the problem because the, 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 the problem is, is that we haven't excavated all of them, right? And the, the, the latest evidence in the lowest levels is actually from a thousand years ago but it doesn't mean to say that these weren't cleaned out and then reused and cleaned out and reused right. but the problem is with that is that that would mean that they were so cleaned out perfectly that any earlier dating evidence has been completely removed and that's really not possible um, there's always going to be some evidence it's, it's like it's like a murder scene right yeah. There's always something left behind. There's always a bit of blood or a bit of hair um, or in Monica Lewinsky's dress. There's something else. But the fact of the matter is, there's always something. Talking about Monica Lewinsky's dress, Jane. No, very interesting, though. I was thinking about the, um, I've forgotten those people now what they're called. But... Bacapoya. Yeah, it's weird, isn't it? But looking at the, um, looking at the mummies, pictures of their bones and what have you they do look like they've got very long uh, leg bones so they probably were tall at the least yes yes yeah i i i i, I agree with that i completely agree um who's left who, who's left now um what's what's that what's that woman called chris just um could you spell the name of the caves please um v-a-l-e-r-o-n valeron V-A-L-E-R-O-N. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> and, and very much, very much what I've done, the, the settlement associated with the, um, the, the settlement that I've mentioned, the um, Lari, um, Lai Raga 
settlement associated with a grouche, every time you type that into the internet, what you get is Valeron. Right? Mm -hmm. And you, yeah, it, it, unfortunately, everything seems to go back to the same thing. So there's not as much information out there as there could be on these people. But obviously, when we do the mummies, we can obviously uh, look at that. So um, who else have we got left? Ellen? <clears throat> um, you know when you said that the Spanish said there were towers? Say that again? You know you said the Spanish said that there had been towers? Yes. What word did they use? What was the Spanish word that they used? Um, I don't know, but do you want me to try and see if we can work that out for next week? No, that's all right. It's just that there are a variety of words that can be used and with a slight difference in meaning. Oh, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So it may not actually be a tower in, in, in as much as what you're thinking of. Oh, oh is what the, the text is thinking of. So, yeah, no, that, that's obviously a misinterpretation of... Oh, no, 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 I'm not saying there is a misinterpretation. There could be. What, what word was used initially to describe what was the... Okay, okay. Okay, okay. sorry. Okay, no, 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 not, not a problem, not a problem. Um, the answer is I don't know specifically what Spanish uh, word they use. It's a bit like the English language, isn't it? Lead and uh, lead and yeah, lead and yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, two completely different things. Yeah, that's a really good point. And Spanish, Spanish is the the easiest language on the planet to learn if you're English speaking because it's word for word. Uh, except, except if you go into a restaurant and you say the word cockanudo and I got thrown out. Um, Karen and um, that that witch Kathy, anything you'd like to say? Okay, don't yeah, mind we're me. We're just curious about Keith's picture. Keith, that big picture behind you, what's it of? Uh, a big picture? Yeah. That one there? That one, oh. yeah. That's all items recovered from the battlefield of Waterloo. Right. Mm. Uh, Okay, just, just, just oh. Kathy thought that there was a representation of a pair of buttocks in it. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's wish fulfillment on Kathy's part. Isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so no buttocks then. Not that I know of. No. <laughs> Very Freudian, that. Yeah. After the break, Keith. Oh, it still looks like a bun. <laughs> <laughs> Right, thank you. <laughs> okay, moving on. Do you know I'm absolutely gobsmacked because I I just cannot I cannot I I, I just yeah, right okay I I'm actually lost for words I I, I don't even Can know. Can anyone else see buttocks in it? No. <laughs> <laughs> just look <sort of> pixelated. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just make a comment, right? If that is a pair of buttocks, right? Is it male or female buttocks? <laughs> female, obviously. They're rounded. <laughs> Kathy, put it onto speaker view and then you'll see just Keith on his own on the full screen. <laughs> That'd be even worse. And they don't look like buttocks at all. <laughs> no, and they're actually, if they are buttocks, um, I do believe Napoleon is in the middle of them. <laughs> there is a, there, I mean, there is a postcard at the top, and there's a picture in the middle of, of Napoleon from the anniversary in uh, 2015. Did he turn up? He did on his horse. <laughs> <laughs> he, he didn't ride a horse. <laughs> he had a horse called Marengo. Yeah, the, after the Battle of Marengo, and. and exactly. um, and the dish of a, a Marengo, chicken Marengo. As, as yeah. De Jure relieved him at the Battle of Marengo, um, in the afternoon he had lost the Battle of Marengo and in the evening he had won it. Exactly. Exactly, my son. That was his, that was his great victory. <laughs> what are you doing, Mike? He's just putting his... Right, let's do the articles of the week, right? Here we go. It's a woman's gurgle, right? Chris knows there. all about these. How a medieval scroll girdled women's loins for labour. When you don't have epidurals, when midwives recommend praying to drag on killing saints rather than breathing exercise, 
And when half the women you know died in childbirth, you'll give anything a go. Even it seems smearing yourself in honey and wearing a sheepskin girdle bearing protective incantations. An analysis of a medieval scroll has shown definitively that it was not just a repository of prayers to aid a successful birth. Instead, it was in cell itself used during childbirth, most likely as a girdle around a mother during labour and was reused countless <coughs> times. That, that, and it wasn't even washed. <laughs> I'm speechless. Scientists have discovered stains. Oh, oh no. <laughs> oh, no. There's evidence. There's evidence of countless cervical fluids. Oh, I don't want to do any. Oh, I don't want to do any more. Of, no, I'm not doing any more of that. Right. Carl, Carl, this is a good moment for me to go now. Yeah, I, I, I think so, because I've just stopped doing that one. It's just... <clears throat> Right, yeah. I'm, really, I'm off. Okay, have a nice Here second time. Jane, Jane. Jane I'll, I'll, see you next, I'll see you next week. And see you next I'll, week. Jane, I'll see you next week. We love you always. I do particularly. Bye then, next week. Bye. 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 I, I love her husband as well because he sounds sexy. <laughs> so, so you, here we go. I, I, I'm not going to read any more, but that there, it says, an analysis of stains... On the three-metre-long parchment held in the welcome collection suggests it would have been tied around women in labour. Oh, lovely. Then talk about the treasures found on Elgin's ship. You can imagine a war, Jim lad. Come and get my Elgin marbles. Um, the mentor hit rocks and sank near the Greek island of Kythera. Nice. Kythera mechanism. Um, in 1802, while carrying the Greek statues to England after they were removed from the Parthenon. I don't get this. The the um, the uh, the marbles dating from about 450 were removed from the wreck. All oh, right, I didn't know that. They tiny, actually went yeah. down. They actually went down to the um, Dave, Davy Jones's locker. And then they were then lifted on the orders of Admiral Nelson soon after the ship went down. I didn't know that. Did anyone know that, that the Elgin Marbles went down on the ship? I did. Cassie did. More artefacts have been brought up from the vessel since Greek archaeologists started diving it in 2011, including shoe soles, belt buckles, here we are, right, coins, chess pieces and even a statue of Lloyd George and cooking utensils. Among the new finds is a measurement instrument believed to have belonged to William Martin Leake. That's why the ship went down, because he leaked. <laughs> a topographer and diplomat who was among the 12 people on board. You see, that's proof. It leaked. Oh, yeah. awesome. They were all... Um, Everyone else was rescued. Anyway, that, that's that. So we've got this ni nice image. Um, asteroid just confirmed. Dinosaur extinction. The case of what killed the dinosaurs have finally been closed for the 25th time. Scientists now have evidence definitively linking their, uh, their uh, extinction to an asteroid known as Nelly. Um... <laughs> Seven miles wide that hurtled into the Earth about 66 million years ago on the 14th of October at 5.15. A new study des um, describes a piece of evidence that had been re remained elusive for decades. The first detection of asteroid dust buried deep inside the suspected impact crater. Mm. The thing is, right, there's going to be asteroid dust everywhere on the planet. Death by asteroid. Um, the asteroid created a 10 mile wide crater off the coast of Mexico. Death by asteroid rather than by a series of volcanic eruptions or some other global calamity has since um, 1980 been the leading theory for a dinosaur demise. So all I'm going to go right 
is that this theory will probably change again in the next 10 years. Littlefoot gives up her, her secrets. Um, so Littlefoot. Uh, more than 3 million years ago, one or, or more... One of our evolutionary forebearers lived in Africa, sharing a habitat of forest and grassland with prehistoric big cats and, and climbing trees to compete with existing baboons for food. It sounds like the typical a person who lives in Lantwit. Yesterday, thanks to a beam of light created in an Oxford laboratory that was 10 billion times brighter than the sun, scientists were able to reveal details of her childhood. Two years ago, the little foot fossil... Um, which in our Australopithecus arrived at the Diamond Light Source Laboratory in South Africa and they've been actually dating it. Still preserved an astonish astonishingly small blood vessels running through a skull. Potential clues to how the br brains of modern humans evolved. So they're actually looking at the pitting in the teeth to work out what she ate. Um, and it goes, it, the article is actually quite long so they're sort of really analyzing these bones to um really work out um what um what what the, the these could actually reveal to us so there you go pompey poised to give up even greater treasures standing on a grassy hillock the grassy knoll uh, in the middle of pompey the ancient site's top archaeologists took bets on what would be found a few feet below his feet when digging starts there this year. The city block beneath here appears to have just two entrances. So I would say we will find two long houses belonging to uh, to wealthy owners, wealthier than the homes we have just excavated. The discoveries promise to continue a golden age for the Italian site, as wall painting skeletons and even a fast food joint emerge after almost two millennia. And my personal thoughts are that the third of Pompeii that is still left to be excavated shouldn't be excavated. And the simple reason is they keep finding more and more stuff and they get problems conserving it. Mm. Stonehenge should be sent back to Wales. Letter by Keith. By the <laughs> way, Keith, I've got my latest article in the Baron District uh, News if you want to buy it. Oh. So oh. go on, get the Baron District News, everybody. Where do I get it oh, from? Okay. What's that? Where do you get it from? Barry. Yeah. So <laughs> well, you can. <laughs> well, you can you can get them from that um the Philco's. All right. Oh. Stonehenge should be returned to Wales after claims that um, uh, Lynn Jenkins suggests it was similar to uh, Greece's bid to reclaim the controversial Elgin marbles. What a load of crap! What if Wales tries to reclaim Stonehenge? If not, the government should give Wales a... F oh, what a load of rubbish. Right, anyway. DNA may tell if Richard III was a good king or bad king. Um, he was the king who, according to Shakespeare, det determined to prove a villain. Um, they're going to look at his complete genome of the last uh, Plantagenet king. And the genome... Um, and the genome will relate to the genetic problems that he may have had it's really interesting and runs the gamut from his blood type uh, to um to was he lactose intolerant to was he genetically predisposed to baldness or heart disease um and king said that analysis could among other things help reveal us um the genetic basis for his scoriosis um so how this proves that he was a good or a bad person i don't know um, that's that's quite dodgy, isn't it? Sort of, yeah. That's actually pretty wrong. Looking at somebody's genome to see if they're going to be an evil mass murderer or not. Mm. Yeah, mm. I, I I'm not happy with that. I feel very um, awkward about that. And by the way, doesn't Richard the Third look like a woman? Looks like you. What? Not like me. Are you? No, my. Shut up! Indian stone tool implies humans left Africa quickly. What we've got is evidence in India of humanoids living as far back as 2.8 million years ago. Which then begs the question did we actually come out of Africa? 
Mm. It's an uh, ancient Greek bullseye, a, a bronze bull figurine dating back at least two and a half thousand years has been unearthed at the ancient site at Olympia. There, there it is. There's a bull. Signs of human sacrifice unearthed in ancient cave. Um, the skull believed to be of a woman among... Uh, this is very new, between 24 and 40 years old, was found alongside the remains of an older man in a cave near Cadiz. The, the, yes, this only came out a few days ago. Decapitation and presence of what... Um, appears to be an altar and the skeleton of a young goat or sheep suggests some kind of sacrifice. Although the simultaneous um, natural death of both individuals can cannot be ruled out, the natural death of one and the, um, the ritual sacrifice of the other or the sacrifice of both may be equally likely. In other words, they don't have a clue. So these date back to um, 6,800 years ago. Um... And a hole has been carved into the woman's skull when she was still alive. Uh, trepanning, because we know it's slightly healed. Trepanning, as the process is known, was carried out in Neolithic times, either for spiritual or medicinal purposes. So basically, because it's showing that she's, she's got trepanning, which healed, and her head, head was cut off, says that she was a sacrifice. We've got so much evidence these days that lots of people have been losing their heads after death. In account to um, lots of bodies from Romania, um, where people have had been de decapitated to stop them coming back to life. So that's done after death. It doesn't mean to say there's a sacrifice. And finally, um, the Bayard Tapestry, um, the Bayard Tapestry, two million pound loan. Um, so basically, listen to this. Uh, the mayor of Bayer said the tapestry could cross the channel only if the UK agrees to undertake uh, to invest in re restoring it to the sum of two million pounds. Well, seeing as it probably came from Britain in the first place, why don't we just keep it? You see what I did there? Elgin marbles. Yeah, yeah. West Wales Stonehenge. Mm. Benin, Benin bronze. Benin bronzes. Tell you what, right? We'll do this, right? We'll keep the Bayer Tapestry. It's ours, right? We're keeping it, right? Give the Benin Bronzes back to Nigeria. See what I did there? Mm. And that's what we'll do. And by the way, the Elgin marbles can stay here. Because I don't like the Greeks. Anyway, so that's it. I don't like the French either. Sorry, Mike. <laughs> I like the Spanish, particularly our Portuguese woman I used to know. Anyway, um, on that note... Hey, oh, hey, hey, I've I got one last thing. Anyone wants to join us on Monday, I've got a live thing at 8 o'clock. And, and we do we do um, Tales from Wales. This week we're doing King Arthur. I do it live and I'm a bit nuts. Keith, what would you like to know before we have a break? I was going to say, what are your chickens getting up to out there? They're getting a bit frisky. Ah, that's what it is. It? Ah. Mike went, in there, Mike went in there naked and they thought they saw a worm. <laughs> <laughs> On that note, let's have some lunch. <laughs> yeah. Break for coffee. 15 minutes, folks, and we will be back. And, I, and, I, and just for Ellen, I will stop recording because she doesn't. Ellen likes to talk about women's things like brothels. Um, and I, I will be back. So, uh, right, right. We're going to uh, pause that. Right, I've got, I've got a very serious video to show you. And um, I'm hoping that. Um, uh, you will be able to hear um, this. So, um, Keith, um, yeah. tell me if you can hear um, this when it comes on, okay? One, two, three. Yeah, 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 music. Go for it. Listen to this. Please subscribe and like. Uh, you know, I'm just trying to find some real... It's very faint. You can't hear it. Not really. It's very faint. Uh, All right, then let, let, let me uh, let me stop. But ba basically, I'm I'm um, I'm showing evidence from the Iron Age at the top of Gethley Mountain, um, which is in the Ronda Vower. They actually had chairs in the Iron Age. And and this is actual proof that they actually had chairs in the Iron Age. Wow. Because this is in an Iron Age roundhouse. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because. 
this is the Iron Age. They've yeah. got iron frame chairs. Mr. Mrs. Ogg. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's amazing. So, so not only an Iron Age building, you've got Iron Age chairs. And that is proof that they are from the Iron Age. And, 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 you, know, you, you can't get better evidence than that, can you? No, that's I mean. proof. Living so, proof, I would so, say. So, in other words, they're Iron, age, they're iron age chairs in an Iron Age oh, building. Circle. And they're, and they're Iron chairs, so that's proof. Yeah, 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 probably. I, I wouldn't disagree. Uh, I, I would. Anyway, so um, Mike, Mike sat there, you know, um, and, he, and I, I asked him in front of you all, I said, look, can you find uh, something in the metal detecting magazine, right? And, um, and uh, is there a metal detecting magazine? Yes, there is. It's this one. There's a couple of them out there. I've seen them. Oh, Treasure right. hunting, yeah. Um, and actually, there's this guy. We've got an article in the next newsletter. Oh, oh I can't, I, I can't call it a newsletter anymore because it's our official publication, right? Um, uh, there's this guy who's been metal detecting down in West Wales. We've got. He's, he's found a nice little brooch which will be in there. And he's actually found a gold um, um, Dutrigi um, Iron Age coin, a stator coin from uh, a gold coin. He's found a gold coin from Hampshire. And um, these these little things here, th these little things here were actually um, a lead scallop shells, which are actually carried by pilgrims. Mm -hmm. And uh, th these are sometimes these were um, hollow, and they with a little stopper on them, and they actually carried some holy. Um, <coughs> holy water in so that that's that, and um, <coughs> and what 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 else can I show you? Oh God, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. Um, let let, let me have a oh, and uh, yes, metal detecting. Now this is this is not a good idea. I've got to be honest with you. Metal detecting around Second World War buildings. <laughs> now. As much as they might find buttons or cap badges, right? They might find other things. And i got to be honest with you, right? That's a no. Let's not do that one. Just, just keep that one there. Right, so just before we um, crack on now, uh, I'd like to mention that next week we're visiting Ireland. Right, so we're visiting the Emerald Isle. Heart and of her. And what we're doing next week? We're going to do a big on Thursday day. And we're ready to party here. Um... In other words, the translation is we're going to be doing those big long towers, right? Um, that were thought to be sanctuary towers from Viking raids. Ooh. So that's what we're going to be doing next week, right? That's good. So uh, yes. So Mike, you got another twenty minutes of you? Yeah. Yeah, Mike. Mike's still, Mike. Mike wants me to make him dinner now. Beans on toast. <laughs> that's not a bloody cheek. I tell you what, he comes here, right? He pays his money. He brings me a friggin' loaf, two chocolate doodads, right? And he expects to have a free free meal. I'm telling you now. Ooh. Anyway, so uh, anyway, let's let's screen share. Going back to the screen, right? We we've got the um, doodads. And what I'd like to do is is not spend a massive length of time looking at the Guauche mummies, but when you describe them as being mummies, um. There are different contexts of describing um, a mummy. For example, a, a mummy is anything that's been um, that has survived um, in either a um, a bog body form that can be classed as a, a mummy, uh, a mummy that can be um, described as something that's been placed in wrappings. A mummy can be classed as um, a body that's been placed up into the Alps, a child as a sacrifice to gods. Um, a mummy could be a body found in ice. A mummy is actually used um, to fill a number of different ills within the archaeological record. We've got the the bead, the bead man's mummy as well. Oh, that would took well, the bead man mummy from Cumbria, which we did a long time ago. That could be classed as a mummy. Uh, mummies associated with Cadell Hallen on South Uist, the Bronze Age mummies. So these these typically we'll, we'll call them mummies and. Um, there's a lot of association. They they are wrapped. The more wrappings they say that these mummies are actually placed into, um, it's almost as if the more 
um, important they are in society. So obviously if you're using a lot, lots of skins from animals, then those animals are going to be quite valuable on islands like the Canary Islands. So, you know, these people are being buried in them. So if you get some of the mummies, we're told, had 10, 15, 20 layers of wrappings on them. Right. Usually they're placed into skins rather than um, wrapped. Um, but anyway, let, let's just sort of describe a little bit. And um, that, that'll that take us to the end more than anything today. So that's what I'd like to do. So are you still looking at that um, image of the mummy? Wonderful, um, Keith? Yes, we are. Right. So I've mentioned the Guauche mummies before. Now, Guauche mummies are the intentionally desiccated remains in this associated with the canary islands the desiccated remains of members of the indigenous um berber people um of um the canary islands and obviously originated from africa trying to get into my flow there they're found in grand canary they're found in tenerife and so on so the, we know that there were thousands hundreds of thousands of guauche mummies initially but a fact that lots of people don't know in the um, this is Egypt now this gives you an idea of context in Egypt in the 1910 there were millions of mummified ibis birds right so what they did they 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 chucked all those ibis birds into furnaces um, for the various industrial processes around Cairo so you know the, the, it's Guauche mummies were treated similarly, but they were also treated to be used in the medicinal industry. <coughs> and also, I don't know if anyone remembers. Can anyone remember a Chinese health herb shop that opened in Barry near the multi-story car park um, in Barry about 20 years ago? Can anyone remember that? Well, they yeah. had a jar in there with um, desiccated ground down human remains. Yeah. Which were used to cure stomach ache. But I didn't ever go in there to be treated for anything. <laughs> so you say. So I say, yes, yes. I, I used to hang around the street corners elsewhere. The methods of embalming, they say are similar to those within an Egyptian context. But again, the biggest problem is trying to yay or nay or understand these more. Um you're looking at that that embalmed cadaver there and uh, this is actually on display uh, in the santa cruz museum so you've got several on display in santa cruz museum and you've got this beauty here in a glass cabinet so they're displayed in different ways and forms right so this one's been taken out of the wrappings and if you obviously look at there we don't have many mummies to go by as, as i've already said i keep repeating that and that, that's a big shame We've got a few today. So in Gran Canaria, there is currently a debate on the true nature of, of mummies, of the ancient inhabitants of the island. Uh, some, some argue that there's a difference in mummification between the islands. Uh, Gran Canaria, Tenerife and, and some of the other islands as well. Some believe that on one, some islands... They, they took their dead, they, they, they put them in wrappings and they put them in caves and left them. And they didn't intentionally want them to be mummified, right? But they became mummies, right? For example, Tenerife, the, um, the, the mummies that they found on Tenerife were deliberately treated. Um, and we'll go into that. So it's environmental factors in some cases that are creating mummies rather than deliberately being mummies. For example, who would have said that the bog bodies of Denmark and the bog bodies of Britain and Ireland, who would have said that they were actually going to be deliberately, intentionally remaining on the ground in a mummified state forever? You know, so there's deliberate and non-deliberate mummification. But the best preserved mummies are actually to be found on Tenerife. Now, this is how can i use this in the right context i'm gonna i'm gonna use a bad language this is how shit the uh mummies have been treated on these islands right in 1933 apologies for the bad language um 1933 they found a necropolis in southern tenerife associated with the um 
uh, with the um, town of San Miguel in southern Tenerife. And they found between 60 and 74 mummies, right? Unfortunately, before they could record them properly, the mummies had been ripped apart. Um, anything on them had been looted and all they had was bits of humans lying around the place, right? This is how crap these mummies have been treated. In other words, oh, this is going to sound really racist, but I'm going to say you've got outsiders who are not native to the island have come in and completely disrespected these people's um, native history. For those that remain in the context of being native Canarians. If that doesn't sound racist, I don't know what does. But I said it in that way. A physical examination of Guelche mummies of Tenerife found that they were quite tall. So they are quite tall, but they, they've still got the curly hair of the Berber people. Um, on average, it said that the males uh, were around 1.7 metres in height, and the females were actually quite short at 1.6 um, um, metres in height. And they were robust. So this is where this idea of Cro-Magnum comes from and all the rest of it. And the key point here. The caves give the, 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 the evidence of these silos behind us of, 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 um, um, and, and other locations across the uh, Canary Islands. Um, the date and evidence tells us about a thousand years ago. But the earliest mummies date to 1,800 years ago. But it still bids a question, Tenerife. It still bids a question, did these people ever have any contact with the Romans? Uh, because Rome was at its height around this time. The Romans wrote, we think about these islands, but what the, what the culture exchange was, we don't really know. Anyway, move on. Historical record, medieval Spanish explorers arriving in the islands. Um, we do see some early Spanish explorers go into the islands as early as the 1300s, but they're not conquering it. They're not sort of, they're not in there. They're just, they're just sort of saying hi, boys and girls. There's not, the conquest of the Canary Island doesn't happen until the late 1400s. Um, and there, these, these early reports um, reported that the Guauche um, were buried in several different ways. The lower class were buried in sandy graves, so they would not be mummified. Others of the upper class were laid to rest in secluded caves. So the secluded caves obviously had having an earlier use um, than being mortuary caves. In some localities, there were up to a thousand in these cave complexes. And now we've only got 20 left. So in, in there's hundreds and hundreds of cave complexes. So, you know, my figure of a hundred odd thousand is probably more like it. So some had some had thousands um, of these mummies. However, many of these have disappeared with only 20 complete mummies left. 20. That's all. That's all we've got. The loss of such a large amount of mummies is generally attributed to the popularity of mammaria. It sounds like an island in the South Pacific. Don't go near there. Don't go near there. It's the island of mammaria. But anyway, um, Mummia, mummia, a pharmaceutical substance created out of pulverized mummies. Wow. Mummia. The Grouche had groups of males and females working as mummification specialists, we do believe, because it's done in quite an advanced way, who would carry out the process according to the gender of the descendant. Um, descendant? Descendant? Yeah. Uh, the Guauche culture considered their individuals unclean due to the nature of their work. So the ones who undertook uh, the processes of mummification were seen to be the lowest of the low, even though they're doing a really important job. Right. It's a bit like the job you used to do, Keith. It was yeah. very important, but you were the lowest of the low. Exactly. Passed out, I was. Yeah, I know you were. You were just given a house in Lantwick Major, weren't you? Exactly, um, yeah. Mummification, to get you out of the way, mummification process. While early explorers reported various traditions associated with gauche mummification, there are three methods identified in modern times through scientific analysis. Preservation, just sort of natural preservation as you are. Stuffing, evisceration, 
So you've got the three forms of visceration, where you're taking some of the organs out, some normal preservation, and taking the organs out and stuffing all, all three at the same time, whatever. These methods have been used in various different combinations, depending on the era in which the mummies were created. That's the problem. We've got 20 mummies, that's it. Now, if we had a thousand, we'd be able to work out that they did that then, and they did that then, and when they did this, women were done, treated this way, men were treated this way. We don't bloody know, right? But they, I do believe very recently, <coughs> They did actually find a cave with uh, which doubled the numbers of mummies that we know about, but I, 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 that's in my head. I can't really remember where I where I got that from. But just move the images again, just sort of um, settle them in a bit more. Um, and there, there we go. And do you know, I'm looking at that. That is the same one as up here, right? So I'm thinking that 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 looks. Uh, uh, I can't, I can't understand if that's actually the wrappings, if that's the same as we're looking at there. But anyway, um, this is one that's, that's the, the wrappings are really uh, decayed in the Santa Cruz Museum, but we've got one in on the island. And that's, that's a scan of one of the heads. You can clearly see that the wrappings have been placed um, in layers above, layers of skin. And, and look at that skin. You can see that that's not a blonde-headed beauty like Chris. It's a very different head. Now, this is what I'm thinking about. Because we've got so few mummies, maybe there are other genetic groups on the island. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, I, I want to go as far as maybe saying, I really didn't explore this on Tuesday, maybe I'd go as far as saying that the, the genetic group uh, that was tall and blonde may have been treated as a different status to people from Africa, right? And that's that's as dodgy as it goes. But what I'm trying to say is that we we don't really we don't really understand um, we don't really understand what we could understand um, if it you know if we had had more mummies. I've got a problem with my uh, scream at this minute. If we had more mummies, we'd be able to make more. Um, credible scientific sets of analysis. Um, but anyway, back back to my notes again. I'm just waiting for my notes to come up. Right? Can you still see me on the screen? Yes. No. I can't. I can't see you. Hang on a minute. See the top of your head. Right. I've I've uh, I've managed to uh, lose my computer screen. Even I can still hear you. No. Oh. This is technology. It is wonderful thing. Hang on a minute, hang on a minute, hang on. Right, one second. I don't know what's happened to you, Mike. <coughs> um, you can see my screen, but I can't. Hang on a minute, hang on. Houston has a problem. Right. Hang on, bear with me, folks. No problem. Well, I should say dim problem. Dim problem. I may have to change my computer screen over because this one's just died on me. Yeah, I've got a computer screen completely died. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute, Mike. <sighs> How I can still have you on the screen and the computer screen has completely died, I do not know. <laughs> oh dear. No dear, exactly. Hang on, let's change the uh, lead over. Bear with me and bearing, bearing, bearing. <laughs> right, okay, folks. You will have me back on in a moment. I've got to go with the menu and I've got to. Back. A V PC on. 
Right, okay, I've got me again. Ah, oh, that's nice. So my computer screen completely died. They do. And uh, so it's this... mummified. Do you know? Do you know what? If I didn't know anything about computers, right? It just I've, I've just like that screen's just died behind me, and I've got the new one. Right, Keith. Um, yes. where where was I, darling? Yes, we're still looking at the mummy. The the gal with her hand, the, the blue glove on the mummy's head. Oh, uh, okay. That that's fine. That that's fine. Let's go back to my notes. So, I was talking about um. Uh, evisceration and preservation and stuffing and my, my final notes talk about in 1876 <clears throat> there was a doctor um, Gregiro um, Narano discovered several incisions in some mummies that he speculated may have been used to remove the internal organs so we got a evi uh, evisceration there that they're, they're removing some of the internal organs to store them somewhere exactly the same as we're seeing the mummification process in ancient Egypt, which is different from the mummification process when we look at, for example, the Inca. So these people have more to do with um, mummification in connection with Egypt um, than we do with anywhere else. So this, this was actually confirmed in 1969 and confirmed that evisceration was a method used by the Guauche along, um, along with other scientists. They're, they're starting to see that the examination revealed that the body had been eviscerated. Then the abdominable oh, flipping on, um, abdomen um, and cavities had been packed with mud-like substances that contained the bark of pine trees so in other words what we're talking about we're talking about removing the organs um, and then we're on about stuffing this is what we see in ancient Egypt they, they, they pad the bodies out to, to look to look presentable um, and they're actually using the bark of pine trees which is really interesting because what we do that tells us that the the Canary Islands must have been covered by pine trees at one point as well um, so we've also we've also got We've also got a substance used in embalming as well. So they embalm their bodies um, so they could be presentable in, in the afterlife as well. And we don't know what substance they actually used in embalming simply because we don't have much evidence now to go by. This is, this is work that was done in, in the 1960s. This is work that was done in the 1870s and work that was done in the 1930s. But unfortunately, because the mummies that we've got now are so precious... They can't and they can't go with the levels of examination that we could put a normal mummy through, for example, from ancient Egypt. If we're if we're cutting open an, a mummy from ancient Egypt, there's there's tens of thousands of them. So, you know, we can we could do a real good job of analysis, but we it's struggling with something so special. There is other evidence as well. At one mummy that they have studied um, from an expert from Quebec that they that they actually also used moss. In some circumstances, to pack, to stuff uh, the abdomen. Um, in addition to moss, there are um, uh, and, and the pine as well. Uh, they're using other packing materials as well. But preservation of the outer parts of the body was normally achieved through a combination of resins and animal skin wrappings. The resins were prepared with a mixture of mineral, plants, and fats. These were spread across the uh, body prior to allowing it to dry, either in the sun or through smoking. So obviously you, you would smoke uh, the body out on the fire. It's just like smoking fish. Finally, the deceased was wrapped in animal skins and laid to rest. The number of animal skins used in wrapping correspond with the individual's social status, with kings being wrapped up to 15 skins or more. So... So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to tr con um, complete with my last images um, and sort of go through these images finally. And so we, we're looking at the Berber hair there. And maybe, maybe I'm a victim of something else today. Maybe I'm just going with the wishful thinking. Maybe there weren't any... Um, to, maybe there weren't any tall, blonde-headed people on the island, right? 
um, maybe it's to do with um, the carotene and everything else that actually gives gives colour um, as faded, um, um, because that hair actually shown there um, looks fairly light, but in fact it would have been black when the person was laid to rest. And obviously the skin colours changed as well. Would have been a different colour skin when the person was laid to rest. So obviously all the, these these bodies have lightened in, in skin tone uh, because obviously um, that there is the same one that we're actually seeing there. So also, also there's differences in the light as well. Uh, and there's our friend here. Now this, this is an unusual one because um, genetically this person looks very different than our friend that's portrayed here but again it's all to do with perspective um, this individual looks not as if they're from North Africa but then again we have so little to go by so on that note before I get completely tongue-tied and, and I say more things that I shouldn't be saying are there any questions Goff? No, not really. No, I think it was uh, quite interesting. Yes. Good. Only, that, only um, quite interesting. That last um, photo of the mummy. Yes. Was, that was found on the island, was it? Yeah. The, the, the last one, the... Um, that one, yes. Yeah. It's exactly it as... Look, Go on. Looks quite sort of North, North European, doesn't it? Yes. Now, when if it was a washed up sailor, got <laughs> good teeth. Yeah. See, see that this is this is the problem. This is the problem. We got twenty mummies, right? Now, if you disclude, as I did at the beginning, the Spanish descriptions, and then you start looking at the mummies, then some of them agree with the Spanish descriptions. If you, yeah. if you take um, an open view as I've done that you don't necessarily you, you could um you could look at what we're seeing with the chakapoya um mm -hmm. and this is an island where there are several different genetic types on the island then that that's a good way of looking at it but i, I can't prove one or the other because we have so little to go by mm. we have so little to go by so um and anything you would so goff we've done you right what about you chris no, thank you, Carl. It was very interesting. Thank, thank you very, very much. And um, what about you, Keith? Any evidence of what they did with the innards uh, once they take them out? You know, like that's the thing. No, we don't. We don't. Because you put knows. them in their little bottles and things. No, nobody knows. That's the thing. What What would have happened is that because because the archaeology is so obvious, because that's in your face. Right. The arc, this stuff is above ground. If you've got a group of Spanish sailors and they want some uh, things to take home, they could find some some pots, empty the contents and just take them home with them. Right. Um, or if there's any organs in anything, they're going to they're going to uh, they're going to empty these and, and whatever. So we're struggling because the Guanche showed their land and who they were above ground whereas most stuff in ancient egypt is below ground it's like the nabataeans we don't get much from the nabataeans because their burials were above ground we get more mummies we get more evidence of the egyptians because it's below ground so this is the problem that we've got with the guanche and the the mummia was a valuable substance so you know it, it's something that is very, very valuable. It's going to be ground down. So everything's of value. When you've got a culture where everything's of value, right, there's going to be little left. I don't, I don't, don't, don't know if you're a fan, fan of The Walking Dead like me, right? Yes. But yes, they, they go in, they go, um, oh, are you on season 10? Anyway, yeah. um, basically, they go into supermarkets now and there's nothing on the shelves, right? But you get the odd odd thing here and there but those things odd here and there are tins of paint that nobody uses right all the good stuff has gone and this is what we see with the canary islands all the good stuff has gone and the other thing as well is 
in the context of archaeology, this isn't archaeology when the Spanish go there. This is a living culture. <coughs> so everything of this living culture is still around and it can be equally dumped onto ships and moved out. And then that's it. That's exactly the same as what happened with the Easter Island people. When Westerners got to the Easter I Island, it was still a living, breathing culture. So they were able to say, I'll have a bit of that because it's not buried or lost. So most of the archaeology is living and breathing and the evidence goes. If, but if you look at Roman civilization, like Pompeii, it's buried under the ground and we're always going to find stuff. If Pompeii was above ground, there would be nothing there now. Not even the frescoes on mosaics. Right, so um, um, we've done Chris, we've done Goff, we've done Keith. Um, do I want to do Jim? Go on, just for a laugh. <laughs> no, I'm not going to do Jim. Uh, what, what about Kathy and uh, Karen? No, no questions. Uh, all right, then. So I think we've done as much as we can do today. It has gone to one o'clock. If there's no other questions, I'll be delighted to see you all next week. Right. So uh, okay. thank you. For, thank you for being patient today. And uh, I've enjoyed it today. I've managed to get through it. So that's good. So I'll see you all next week. Goff, Chris, yeah. Keith, Bye -bye. Jim, Karen, and that witch, um, Kathy. Um... <laughs> And we'll see you all next week. Take care. Bye. Bye, 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 bye daddy. Bye, bye, bye daddy. Bye, 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 daddy. Bye, 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 Sometimes my screen goes off on its own. It just died. It was just and dead. I'll go out of the kitchen, make a cup of tea, and the, the tea's gone off.